This is The Secret Life of Canada, a podcast about the untold and undertold history of Canada. Hey, Leah. Hey, Fallon. So, Leah, here in Toronto, where we live and record the show in our beautiful blanket fort, it has been an especially snowy winter, and I am not what you would call a winter person. I know, because you recently fell down the stairs and broke your foot. And that was inside. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I totally understand. My blood is from Barbados, so you don't have to tell me. This is a trying time. And I have absolutely no excuse, because my people have been in this part of the world for literally thousands of years. Yeah, seriously, what is your excuse? I don't know. Instead of whining about the cold and the snow, I thought maybe it would be a good idea to embrace it. Okay, are we going to go outside? Because I'm not dressed for that. I need, you know what, I need my winter boots, my hat. I also have some insert, like hot pocket inserts. No, we're not going outside, (laughs) but I'm going to take you to a, a, a colder climate. Today, we're going to learn about the North and the Inuit. Thank God, because I I don't know anything about the Inuit, so this is good. Well, what I learned putting this episode together was that there was this doomed Franklin expedition that could have been recovered much quicker if people had listened to the Inuit, that the Canadian government has a history of killing dogs, and that colonization happened a lot later, and the effects are still being deeply felt in the North. Whoa. So, Leah, what's the furthest north you've been? Well, I was born in Edmonton, so some consider that to be north, but I know it's not. I think Fort McMurray? Well, I've been to the Yukon, which is pretty far north, but I don't really know much about the north. I think us Southerners are pretty naive. Yeah, I can admit I honestly probably know the least about the northern regions of Canada. You're not alone. I think many Canadians kind of have this blankness when it comes to the north. We understand climate change and we know that the north is the front lines of climate change. But I think that's kind of where the understanding stops. Mm -hmm. And while we all feel bad for the polar bears, many people don't know about the people of the north. Mm -hmm. So the early inhabitants of the north, the Tunit people, were also known as the Dorset people. They lived from approximately 500 BC to 1500 AD. Another group, the Thule, appeared to be active in the north from about 200 BC to present time. The Thule began migrating east from Alaska in the 11th century. So this would be the Inuit we know today. Yes. And while we can refer to the Inuit people as a single group, we need to know one thing, and that is how vast Inuit territory is. There are Inuit people in Canada, Greenland, in Alaska, and in Russia, and all over the circumpolar region, meaning the area around the North Pole. And with such a large spanning territory, there will obviously come diversity. For today's episode, I'm going to focus on an area called Inuit Nunagut, in what is now called Canada. Now called Canada. I see what you did there. So Inuit Nunagut, which translates to land, ice, water, in Inuktitut, the language of the Inuit. Inuktitut is the language. Inuktitut is a grouping of languages. There are about five languages that are closely related, and some of those languages have subsections. But for the purposes of today, I will refer to the language as Inuktitut. Okay, gotcha. So Inuktitut is the language, and Inuit Nunagut refers to the land. Yes. Okay, and great. Inuit Nunagut is made up of four areas. I tried really hard to get these pronunciations right, so apologies, my deepest, deepest apologies if I didn't. They are Inuvialuvit, which is in the northwest part of the Northwest Territories, Nunavik, which is in North Quebec, Nunatsiavit in Labrador, and Nunavut, which is a territory onto itself. Nicely done. Very nice Somebody give me a cigarette. <laughs> I mean, I know Nunavut, but I had no idea about the other regions. Oh, God, me neither. So these four regions make up about 35% of Canada's land mass and 50% of Canada's shoreline. That's incredible and massive. I know, it really is. So this giant piece of land, this giant piece of land in Canada is like uh, where our largest knowledge deficit is. Yeah, really, really interesting. Okay, so why are there four regions? Well, my understanding is that these regions are defined to help Inuit people negotiate with the government for mining and management of their resources. The boundaries of Nunavut were drawn up in 1993, but the territory wasn't created until 1999. Ah, 99. Raverware, Frosted Tips, Y2K. (laughs) Brittany Jean Spears met a young man named Justin Timberlake, and their love was legendary. Still together wearing matching jean outfits 
at the MTV Music Awards. Like, that was a time close to my heart. You know a lot about this. I do. Sadly, you know, I, I you wait. Know, I do you know more this. about Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake's <laughs> relationship than you do about Canada's You know North. what? If they could stay together, like, right now, she's in Las Vegas. He's blowing it at the Super Bowl. I feel like if he they're looks kind of haggard. Eh? He's not looking good. No, and he's it's not. just, it's over. Yeah. It was a good time, wasn't it? 1999. 1999. 99, the year Nunavut was created. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the territory alone is the largest in Canada and one of the least populous, second only to the Yukon. Not only that, but the Inuit population is a very young group with a median age of about 35. But not every family fills out a census, so these numbers can be difficult to track accurately. I can imagine it'd be really hard to track. Yeah, for sure. A lot of Inuit moved into urban centers for work and for education and with a large population moving to Ottawa, around three to 4,000. But again, that number can be difficult to track with families living communally and with the long census only being distributed to every 10th household. Okay, right. And I have to say there is something really heartwarming about the growing numbers of the youth population of the Inuit because Canada did a lot of horrible things to the Inuit people. Mm -hmm. That sounds familiar. But you know what? It, It makes me happy to know the genocide that Canada thought it was perpetrating. It didn't work. Like the Inuit are still here. They're young. They're going to take over, and hopefully they will be running things very soon. I look forward to that day. Yeah, and I mean, it's a similar thing in in First Nations communities. A lot of our populations are quite young. Like, Mm -hmm. we're young and we're procreating Mm -hmm. at a record number. So take Mm -hmm. that, Canada. Well, while First Nations Métis and Inuit get lumped together, I cannot stress this enough. These groups are very, very different. Do not lump all of these groups of people together. We are all separate, different people with different languages, different governance systems, different clan systems. Some don't even have clan systems. Sometimes we refer to ourselves by our nation. Sometimes we don't have nations. So it's a thing that, you know, Canada really needs to start to understand. So like the little checkmark box that you sometimes have to check for government forms and things. Yes, exactly. Like that little box says Inuit. First Nation or Métis. Like, we are all the same. Or if we check that box, we somehow are all the same. It's no wonder people get confused and why we Indigenous people are always having to explain the difference between us. And Indigenous is the word to mean all of those groups, right? Like, when you need an all-encompassing word, you say Indigenous, meaning Inuit, First Nations, or Métis. Exactly. But It can paint us all with one brush and create confusion and misunderstanding about our differences. I spoke with Tiffany Ayalik about why she thinks this is true. Hi, my name is Tiffany Ayalik. I'm originally from Yellowknife Northwest Territories. I'm an Inuit singer, songwriter, actor, dancer, performer, um, and outdoors enthusiast. I think that not a lot of people know things about the North. We don't grow up learning about the North in terms of, you know, the the diversity. We don't grow up learning about the economy and sort of the people that live up there other than sort of one one chapter within a poorly made textbook from the 80s. So I feel like a lot of people don't know that in the North, it's an incredibly diverse and largely Indigenous populations in some communities. And uh, in some places, like the Northwest Territories, there are 11 official languages. People get pan-Indianized or pan-Indigenized, and, you know, you just see a, a person with, you know, high cheekbones and long, long, long brown hair or long black hair, and it's easy to kind of paint everybody with the same picture when really there is incredible diversity and um, rich, rich diversity within, you know, within, you know, even within separate groups. I'm sure she and I could both go on about this all day, but... We're here to talk about history. That's right. That's what we do. (laughs) So when I began my research on the Inuit, one thing that kept coming up over and over was the Franklin Expedition. Yeah. So I remember this because Stephen Harper came out, took a lot of credit for its discovery in the news back in 2014. It was a really big deal. Um, What I know is it was a famous explorer ship that disappeared, was never heard from again. And then the frenzy and desire to find it became kind of legendary. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. There were two ships in the Franklin Expedition. And in 1845, the expedition set out from London in search of the Northwest Passage, which the British hoped would provide a faster route to, and I'm using air quotes here, the Orient. Boo! No, that is not a good word. I know. 
And so this voyage was not the first. Many had attempted to find this route. Franklin himself had tried previously and failed. Uh, it was on that voyage that he got the nickname, the man who ate his boots. Wait, did he actually have to eat his boots or was that some kind of metaphor? Oh, no. On his previous mission, he and his crew were forced to eat the leather parts of their clothing to avoid starvation. Oh, and this included their boots. That's really bad. But, but you know what? With a little salt and pepper, you got jerky. Am I right? This is why you don't cook for me. <laughs> This expedition was going to be different for Franklin. Um, the ship had been fortified. They had enough supplies to keep them alive for almost three years. And they had brought along lemon juice, 930,000 pounds of it to be exact. And that was to prevent scurvy. Ah, uh, scurvy. This is a reoccurring theme of our podcast now. By the way, many people wrote us with stories about actually knowing people who got scurvy in university because of our last episode <laughs> where we mentioned scurvy, which we thought was a good joke. Um, it was interesting. It was weird. Please keep the emails coming. We want to know more about scurvy in Canada yeah, in the, 2018. I think, I think the secret life of scurvy. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be the next <laughs> Secret life of scurvy in Canada. <laughs> so they brought along all of these supplies, all of these useful supplies, but they also brought along a lot of useless Victorian niceties, Bibles, uh, button polish, an organ. Oh, my gosh. You know, when I go up north... I know. Pre-technology. I need my org. <laughs> <laughs> they had a library of about a thousand books, and they brought uh, this new invention. It was a relatively new invention. It was canned food. Okay, well, that is a lot of things that might not be good for the North, except the lemon juice sounds reasonable and good, and the canned food sounds, those are good ideas. Well, one would think, but you are wrong, Leah. The 30,000 tins of the food that they brought, it had been soldered closed with lead. Oh, damn. Yeah, damn is right. <laughs> Bad. Damn. <laughs> and so when the ship was uh, was frozen in the ice, not once but twice, the men ate the supplies and thought, you know, like, good on us. We brought the right thing. But they didn't know that they were slowly getting lead poisoning. Uh, lead is not good for you guys. That's the takeaway lesson here. Um, so did they ever encounter the Inuit? I mean, I imagine that the Inuit could have helped them out. They did possibly. encounter them. And some of the men actually survived for six years. I thought there were no survivors, though. How do we know this? Well, the British Navy offered a reward of 20,000 pounds. That's a lot. Yeah, it was like, it's like around a million dollars, I think. And so they offered this large sum of money. So there were a lot of people who were willing to go over and search for people and search for the Franklin expedition and see if any of those men were still alive. Right. And so that was also like part of the reason why the North was mapped. Uh -huh. And why there are a lot of these, like, you know, explorers' names all over that land up there. Right. So this was like the catalyst, almost like the moment this area kind of turned into a gold rush area. Because it's like, if you can find the treasure, this lost ship and these men, there's bounty. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. One of the people who who had heard about this reward and who was following, you know, the news stories about the Franklin expedition and the recovery mm -hmm. was this businessman named Charles Francis Hall. And so in the late 1860s, Hall decided to head to the pole to explore and to also see if he could find anything out about the missing men. What he did was something that no one else had done yet. Okay, I already know. He talked to the Inuit. Correct. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so... Hall spent years in the North and documented what the Inuit had to say. And although there were language barriers, Hall eventually learned some of what happened to the men of the Franklin expedition. He kept really good notes and documentation. I came across this list of what the Inuit told Hall they found when they were asked about the Franklin expedition. Friday, July 2nd, 1869. Six paddles, many table knives white handles, one watch, tobacco that had been wet and was in flakes or thin pieces, very many tin dishes, one whole skeleton with clothes on, the flesh all on but dried, many skeleton bones, three skulls, alongside of the boat a big pile of skeleton bones that had been broken up for the marrow in them. They were near a fireplace, skulls among these. It is certain that some of the men lived on human flesh, for alongside of the boat were some large boots with cooked human flesh in them. Cannibalism. Oh, I got that. That was very clear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, in the boots? But you know what? You'd need something like, what are you going to eat? You need a container yeah. to eat out of. So it's just like ancient Tupperware. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> This is this <laughs> ancient Tupperware. <laughs> Can you? What would, that's a really interesting Tupperware lady. Oh, and this one is a men's size nine. <laughs> you tie the laces, <laughs> and, you're, and your best friend's flesh All is of good their for stuff weeks. Was on the ship, the ship went down, so they didn't have any other tins or like knives well, they and did forks. Have some things, but so sure. the boots would have kept things. You know, no, I, I don't know. Put your cooked bits of things in there. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> heaps. Keeps on the ice. <laughs> May God have mercy on their souls. <laughs> I was trying to be respectful. Oh, it's going to be another one where people think we're drunk. <laughs> so the Inuit basically gave him this list. Yeah. The Inuit told him stories about um, how the men of the expedition had split up. Some of them were living on the ship still. Some were living in tents. The Inuit told Charles Hall about how some of the men actually had black faces. And this is a symptom of lead poisoning. But this is also what happens when you do blackface, people. You die. (laughs) Please take note. Yes, exactly. (laughs) So these reports were largely discounted. The British didn't trust the source, the Inuit, and were hardly excited to report their men had cannibalized each other. But what we do know now, after the mummified remains and the skeletal fragments were found, was that the men did indeed have lead poisoning, and some bone fragments had signs of being cut in such a way that would suggest cannibalism. So if the British government would have listened to Hall, who listened to the Inuit, they would have solved this mystery a long time ago. Yeah. By 2016, both ships from the Franklin Expedition, the HMS Terror and the HMS Erebus, were recovered, where the Inuit had said to look in the 1800s. Oh my god. So, I mean, I wonder how many precious resources were thrown at finding a ship of dead white colonizers when, now I know this is going to be controversial, we as a country could have spent it on other things. Like, how about helping the people of the North not spend $47 on a head of lettuce? Food security in the North is a huge issue. Yeah, so other than the search and rescue, why did white people want to go to the Arctic between 1869 and 2016? Well, industry. By the late 19th century, whaling was a pretty big commercial industry. Whale oil was used to light lamps, to make soap and candles. So it was an important old-timey commodity. It was very old-timey. Yes. Yes. Whalers set up posts in the north, and some Inuit were even hired to work on the whaling ships. But with the whalers came disease, predominantly tuberculosis. Oh, of course. And as the world modernized, the need for whale oil decreased, and by 1910, the industry had essentially disappeared. So then all the white people went home. No. (laughs) Then, in 1920s, the Hudson's Bay Company established... Uh, yeah, I know. You Boo, ruined can... everything. Oh, I'm glad you're booing <laughs> now. Yeah, I feel it. I'm it feeling it more. Yeah, it I'm feeling on. it more. Yeah. Okay, so so Hudson's Bay. (laughs) Yes, in the 1920s, the Hudson's Bay Company established a firmer footing in the north. The Arctic fox was a highly sought-after fur at this time, and so where you have the Hudson's Bay Company, you have Mounties, and you have missionaries. Okay, so the holy trinity of Canada screwing over indigenous people. I think if Canada could have accepted the nomadic way of life for the Inuit people, following herds and Mm -hmm. living off the land, uh, and the land sustaining them, then we might be telling a different story. But that, of course, is not the case. No, it's not. So it's the 20s. It's the 20s, and the Hudson's Bay begins to implement Western ideas of settlement, which basically means being stationary. And that totally, again, went against the nomadic way of life for the Inuit people. The Hudson's Bay Company also started uh, to step in for the state in many ways. They stepped in for the feds. Uh, They were the doctor. They were the post office. And this also deeply impacted the migration patterns of the Inuit. It's sort of an interesting time because at this time, Canada was pretty hands-off with the people of the North. Okay, so when did they become hands-on? In around 1939, when the Inuit became citizens of Canada. That seems kind of late. It is. And it happened in a really odd way. In 1924, the Indian Act was actually amended. And when it was amended, the Inuit were included in the Indian Act. And so that was the first time that Canadian legislation recognized Inuit people as being a part of Canada, but it wasn't until 1930 that they actually became Canadian citizens. Okay, gotcha. Right, and that happened because there was a food shortage uh, and the Quebec government was helping the Inuits stay alive and Quebec eventually got sick of sort of footing that bill and handed it over to the feds and that's when they became citizens. And then I'm assuming that's when really terrible things started to happen. For sure. Um, That's when... uh, the forced relocation started. Okay, so did they pushed everyone south. Oh, 
no, 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 further north to places like Grease Fjord, Resolute Bay, and Iqaluit. People were sometimes relocated up to 2,000 kilometers north. So it, it would be like us here in the cozy blanket fort um, in Toronto being moved to Orlando. Oh, hell no. <laughs> I am not moving there. That's really traumatizing. But why were they moving them further north? Well, after World War II, the Cold War era began. Canada started to feel like it was really important to fortify borders. And so they wanted to establish settlements in the north. These settlements were frequently started in tandem with RCMP posts. People were told that they would only have to stay for two years, but of course, you know, that was a lie. They were also promised better hunting conditions. These relocations went on into the 70s. This was also around the time that the E-tags were introduced. Oh no, that does not sound good. Oh, it's not. So the Eskimo identification number system... Mm, We made it this far without saying the E-word, which embarrassingly Edmontonians, as I am one... Uh, We scream that at every football game still. Please change the name. Please change that name. Like, not even please. Change the name. Change the name. Change the name. Not, it's so embarrassing. It's really embarrassing. So the word, the E word, was really hard to avoid when, you know, when I was looking at this stuff because it's, the E word is so entrenched in policy. So the Eskimo identification system was introduced in 1944. At this time, many Inuit people still lived nomadic lives, and the Canadian government wanted a system of keeping track of people. They also had a hard time with Inuit names and naming systems. The tags were a small piece of leather that were about 2.5 centimeters in diameter, and they had to be worn on your person. Sometimes you would pin it to your parka, sometimes it would be on a necklace around your neck, and these tags would describe the region you were from and who you were. So this was happening in 1944, and it sounds a lot like the Yellow Star Hall. Holocaust badges that Jewish people were forced to wear so they would be easily identified by the Nazis. Exactly. And so these had to be worn until 1965. That was the official end date, but I heard that it was like actually going on into the 70s. It seems like the government really wanted Inuit people to be trackable, um, findable. And again, stationary. I wanted to speak with Nalak Ledru to see how she felt about the E-tag system and its impacts on her family. My name is Nautilak Michael LeDrew. I'm originally from Apex Hill, Nunavut, three miles outside of the Khalid on Baffin Island. Elected Inuit elder here in Toronto. I'm an artist. I love to throw sing and drum dance. Growing up in the North, I was raised traditionally. So it was hunting, fishing, camping, out on the land. Families took care of each other. Loved growing up traditionally, but at the same time, there was hardship. E-tags, we call them dog tags. They they were used for government offices and medical. My E-number is E71866. E7 would be Eastern 7th Community, 1,866th child to be registered. I remember my father's e-tag number was E7506. I forget my mother's E7 number. It was like medical insurance. I grew up in two worlds. White society and Inuit society. During my teens, it was very hard because I was more focused into white society, trying to earn a living without the education that they needed. It was a hard time, and it still is a hard time today. That sounds so dehumanizing and sinister, actually. And it's a reoccurring theme of people not knowing about these things until much later in life, you know, as we saw in episode one about BAMP. Right. Right. Uh, Speaking of BAMP, I wanted to talk to uh, a BAMP resident who's actually Inuit, Renalta Arluk. Um, She's an artist, a theater maker, and a director. She didn't know about the e-take system until later in her life. 
seriously. I didn't know about the e tags until I was a little bit older. It's not like I was raised with that that knowledge. And again, it's probably because of shame and, and the old personal shame, which is unwarranted, of course. But we carry so much shame because of residential school. We carry so much shame because of of um because of being made to feel less than for sure, and and taking away the right to travel. That deeply impacted so many families and therefore their generations afterwards. So yeah, the e-tags I didn't find out about until I was like a young adult. In addition to the relocations, another tactic to get the Inuit to stay in one place was the dog slaughter of the 50s no. and 60s. Yes. They were used for transportation in the north. So if you kill the dogs, then people can't move around in the same way. Here's Nalak again. Dog slaughter. Yes, we lived through that. My fa- my family was one of the ones that was affected by it. It was to make the people stay in the community. My father wouldn't be able to go out seal hunting or caribou hunting, polar bear hunting. But those were replaced by machines. My father would go out hunting by snowmobile. But there was a big impact on that because snowmobiles, they broke down. And after they had broke down, my father had to learn quickly how to fix the snowmobile. That is brutal. Mm -hmm. So can we actually say the Canadian government at one time killed dogs? Yes, we can. About 20,000 dogs. And the reasoning was total BS. It was that the dogs were sick or that they were trampling crops. What? In the north, yeah. yeah. What What, what, what are you growing up there? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Let's take a moment. I need to hold my dog, maybe your dog. Yeah, I want to look at some dogs on you. Social media. I think we should, like, post a picture of our dogs on, on social mm. media and just saying, like, you know, if this dog was alive in 1955, 19... it would have been shot by Justin Trudeau. Well, basically, I mean, not Justin I don't know. Yeah, he was in born. Edit that. Edit that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to get audited okay, this year. Oh. I don't want to be audited. Um, Pierre I mean, Elliott that's Trudeau. it's really, really terrible also because, like, dogs... In the north, I'm assuming they're the equivalent of horses at the time in the south. Like, that's how you transported everything. And also that, you know, people had a great connection with these animals. Like, terrible. But there's more, Leah. Oh, there's more. In 1951, the first residential school opened in the north, in Chesterfield Inlet. It was also in the 50s that the Inuit were given the right to vote. Too bad there were no polling stations to vote at. I didn't realize that the right to vote was a sham up there because there were no polling stations. That's some serious voter suppression. Absolutely. And what I learned in my research and from talking to people was that everything happened later in the north. And so what that means is that they're closer to colonization and those impacts are still really, really present in their everyday life. It's interesting because we talked about in the last episode in New Brunswick how the Maliseet people were the first to be colonized, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said something that I'd never realized of like the coasts being the first and then it moved inwards. I think for me, I thought I understand colonization is moving from east to west, but I don't think my brain fully understood how it worked in the north and Mm -hmm. how how different Mm -hmm. it was and how recent. Yeah, the recentness is really surprising to me. And um, yeah. Another thing to note is that people still think they know what's best for the North and for the Inuit people. Anti-sealing activists have consistently been all up in their business and attempting to infringe on their hunting rights and their way of life. I spoke with Inuit documentary filmmaker Alethea Arnakuk Burrell, who directed the multi-award-winning 2016 documentary, Angry Anuk. My name is Alicia Alnacoparil, and I'm a filmmaker. Seal has been a staple food for um, the vast majority of Inuit since the beginning of time, really. Anti-seal hunt campaigns are really a money-making exercise. People who, who lead those campaigns are complete hypocrites, and most of these people eat meat. And I came to this conclusion through years of 
trying to reach these groups, trying to reach these staff people through emails, through tweets, through phone calls, um, showing up at their uh, protests, and their behavior time and time and time again has really just shown that their arguments are baseless, really. You know, there's no denying that a lot of these groups do important work that is really necessary, but not all that work makes money the way that anti-seal hunt campaigns do. So Inuit, who depend on these seals for income and for food, uh, were the casualties. We're, we're just write-offs for them. Uh, the United States banned uh, um, seal products um, back in, I think it was 1979, somewhere around there, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, the European Union banned the skins from white coat harp seal pups. And uh, when those two bans happened, one right after the other, you saw an immediate drop in the income for Inuit. The one specific example I was able to find was for Resolute Bay, which is one of the most northern communities in the world, really. The average income for hunters there went from around 50000 a year down to about 1000 a year. So it was devastation. Of course, we still hunt uh, seals. We still eat seal meat. I eat it all the time with my family um, and always have. But when hunters can't sell the seal skins, it becomes much more difficult for them to continue hunting because um, hunting isn't cheap. It's not like it was in the old days. We live in towns now and need uh, snowmobiles and fuel to be able to go to hunting. They need at least a small amount of cash income. And without that, they hunt fewer seals, which means less food on the table for, for Inuit that aren't even hunters. Um, the way our communities still work, uh, food sharing is a, still a hugely important tradition for us. And um, so a hunter will catch a seal and share with a number of people in his family and community. They're, they're always keeping tabs of um, single mothers and elderly people in the community who can't hunt for themselves, and they share with people who they know uh, don't otherwise have access to food like that. So, you know, it's, it's not just the cash income for hunters that's affected. It's people's ability to feed themselves and, and the, the more vulnerable in their communities are the most affected. Probably one of the most powerful things we can do is to dissuade celebrities from supporting these campaigns because that's how they get their likes and their dollars. They are, whether they know it or not, um, affecting the poorest and most food insecure Indigenous people in all of North America. I know we say this after we do every interview, but man, she is amazing. Right? And if you haven't seen her film, go. Please go see it. It'll give you really great context for understanding the North. So I think as people who live in a southern part of the country, we know that climate change happens. Yeah. We, we understand that. But I think for people in the North, it's a completely different reality. Uh, it's visible. Here's Renalta again. Often when you go north and you see places, those places are still, they still remain the same as what they were, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. Because there hasn't been strong development, you know, as Sheila Wakuche says, like, we're the canary in the coal mine of climate change. For people living in the north, it's visible on a daily basis. Some of the first people who notice the change because they've been there for so long and they know when that piece of ice melts in a way that it shouldn't or, you know, this population of animals is changed in a way that well, isn't they know normal. the history. They, they know do. the history. They do. I mean, I hope we start to listen to them because I know that they've been telling us this for a really long time and we haven't listened. That's sort of like a really big takeaway for me is that we haven't been listening. Canada really doesn't listen to our northern people. And I think there's not only a lot we can learn, but I think there's things that are going to save us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So over the past month, I had the opportunity to meet and speak with many Inuit people. And I knew they were Inuit, but I don't think I fully respected or understood how truly amazing they are as a people and how little their unique place in Canada is understood. I wanted Nalak to have the last word. If you have a chance to go out on the land, take the opportunity. 
You see the beauty, how beautiful our land really is. Have fun! <laughs> the Secret Life of Canada is recorded in Toronto on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit. It's hosted by me, Leah Simone Bowen. And me, Phelan Johnson. And produced by Katie Jensen. Special thanks goes out to Tuna Savinga Inuit. If you need information on the Inuit, I highly recommend getting in touch with them. Nathan Burley wrote and performed our theme song. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Secret Life CAD. If there's a story you would like to see in an episode or a piece of history you would like to tell us about, please email us at secretlifeofcanada at gmail.com. Thanks for exploring Canada's hidden history with us, and remember to pass it on. <laughs>